in four Americans report having a disability. There are over 38 million people with disabilities that are eligible to vote in the United States. This is 16.3% of the electorate. And in our state, Florida, we have over 2.7 million voters with disabilities, which is the third highest <clears throat> number in the United States. Marilyn, you wanna take over? Yes, sadly, here in Florida, many <laughs> of the 2.7 million voters with disabilities that are ed eligible to vote are not voting. And we want to change this. September the 9th through the 13th, I believe, are the dates for National Disability Voting Rights Week. And what we are encouraging is that each community would um, go out and um, talk to your local elected officials about how important it is to reach out to citizens with disabilities. Many of them don't know that they can vote or that they're even eligible. We had a um, meeting of our local league not long ago, and it was amazing to me that people were confused about whether individuals that reside in assistive living facilities were eligible to vote or not. And of course, the answer to that is, unless a judge has declared the person incompetent or needing a guardian, everyone with a disability is eligible to vote. And it's important for us to vote because many of the services and programs that we need are made possible by funding from the state local and federal governments. So if they don't know that we need a particular program or that program uh, requires additional funding, then it may not happen. And also it voting and getting to know your elected official from the perspective of a person with a disability um, forms a bond. It forms communication between the elected officials and citizens with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act would not have been possible had not individuals with and without disabilities worked together in order to encourage Congress to pass this important legislation. So that is why it's so very important that we encourage persons with disabilities to vote because it's our lives that they hold um, power over. The next slide that I have up, it, the title's called The Ripple Effect of the Disability Vote. And I love this graphic because it, it really visualizes the power of the disability vote and that there actually is the potential for this this voting block of people with disabilities. And as I describe the circle, we talked about the number of people with disabilities that have the ability or the potential to vote. But imagine those concentric circles going out. You've got their immediate family that care about issues that are important to people with disability. You have their friends, their advocates, educators, professionals, providers, and even government and bureaucrats. So there's this ripple effect of issues that are important to people with disability and how other people will vote for or in favor of those issues or in favor of people that are gonna support issues that are important with people with disabilities. And when you put that all together, you've now increased those numbers we told you before, and it becomes more than a quarter of all eligible voters may be interested in issues that are important to the disability community. It's projected that 67.7 million eligible voters either have a disability or have a household member with a disability. Now we know how close elections are. Imagine if 
we could harness the power of this population of getting people with disabilities to vote and picking people that support their issues, we could change who wins elections. And th these are people that aren't even voting now, a lot of them. So these are potentially new people to register, new people to educate, new people to be voting and participating in our elections. It represents 28.9% of the electorate. Huge numbers, huge potential. I always tell people disability rights are civil rights. They're just like every other civil right that you hear about in the community, but sometimes disability gets left out of the conversation. People with disabilities have a large, powerful, and potentially decisive percentage of the electorate, as we just talked about. Marilyn, do you want to add anything to this? Just that as we have, you know, rights that protect women who um, want to vote and own property, uh, minorities um, from discrimination, it, the same is true for persons with disabilities and civil rights. Uh, let me maybe give you an example that I advocate for here in our local community for many years, our transportation disadvantage program in Palm Beach, you call it Palm Tran. Well, because of the Americans with Disabilities Act and civil rights legislation, um, each community must provide according to their funding levels and working with the Commission for the Transportation Disadvantaged here in Florida, a paratransit program that provides door-to-door -door transportation for persons who are disabled. Um, and this enables, these services enable persons with disabilities to travel to work, to school, to medical appointments, to dialysis. And before the Americans with Disabilities Act, there were no programs like this. So yes, disability rights are civil rights. And the same with education for our children with disabilities. Uh, before IDEA, um, you know, the, the, the services that children with disabilities and, and individuals going to college, you know, they were very hit or miss. And now there is a myriad of legislation that helps to provide services for these individuals that are appropriate for them. Now I'm gonna show you a short video because we're gonna slightly change our focus. We went from telling you about the issue and the statistics and the numbers. Now we're gonna talk about how you guys can be involved and what you can do. And part of that is to talk about how to interact, how to feel comfortable interacting with people with disabilities. And a lot of times they call that disability sensitivity. So we're gonna start with a video, then we're gonna give you a list and give our thoughts on it. And at that point, we can have a discussion as we move forward, you can ask questions and we can really talk about how to make people feel comfortable with interacting with people with disabilities. So I'm gonna start the video, we tested it so the sound should work, but if there's a problem, just let me know. It's about three minutes. Good morning, Bob. Good morning there, big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay. You'll get the hang of it. 
one easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take mine? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't address me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind... May I help you? ...does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath. Relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi. Would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no thanks, but can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Friday. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. So I, I love that video because it, it uses humor <laughs> to really say some important subjects and, and give some really good tips. And we've made a list of some of the really important ones that are on the screen. I'm going to read them out and then we, we can discuss them and Marilyn's going to add in to what is on the list. This list came from a document that we have under resources that uh, the Legal Women Voters of Orange County made to help volunteers. So these are the headings, and then there's more detail on the document that you'll have access to. So speak directly to the individual, make eye contact, introduce and identify yourself, offer assistance in the form of a question, wait until your offer is accepted, listen attentively, Avoid offering remarks of admiration. Avoid being self-conscious. And the last one has used people first language, but then in parentheses, I added most of the time because sometimes people, they use the term identity first language and they feel that their disability identifies them and they like to use the disability first. So it's a very personal and evolving use of how to describe people with disabilities. All right, Marilyn, you wanna take it over? Sure. When communicating with persons who are hard of hearing or deaf, it might be easier to have paper and pencil handy so that you can communicate in writing. And I also think that when we are volunteering with persons who use wheelchairs, we would want lower tables and also to remember to sit down to the with the level of eye level for the person that you're talking with. And as the video 
stated several times, ask us how you may provide assistance. We live with disabilities all our lives, so we know. And the film, the one thing I would say that was uh, maybe they need to change is there are individuals who, like myself, are legally blind and hearing impaired, and we refer to ourselves as deaf blind. And that doesn't mean that the person is totally blind or totally hearing impaired. It can vary the, the amount of vision and hearing that an individual has. And um, I'm just excited with the opportunity to talk to individuals like the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach about how we all can better serve persons with disabilities and um, individuals with autism need a, a quiet setting and um, you may need to repeat the information that you're giving to them more than once and I think that's about it Debbie I'm sure Absolutely. there's more <laughs> we could spend a whole hour just <laughs> on this one topic. It, it, we can go nuanced by disability, but I think this gives you the general overall concept. And it's really just ask, don't make assumptions, and treat people with respect. Debbie, we have a question about, let me get to it. What is an example of people first language? Um, an an autistic person instead of a person with autism. Uh, what we're finding is as people with disabilities get put into decision-making tables and in positions of authority, they're letting us, letting people know how they wanna be referred to. So very high functioning young adults with autism really like to, they, they think that autism is their identity, that they cannot separate the person from the disability. So. They'll be very upset if you call them a person with autism because they identify as an autistic person. Also, sometimes in the deaf community, people that are deaf and live in a deaf culture world don't consider themselves people with disabilities. They're just deaf and that's who they are and that is their identity. So it, it varies from different types of disability, the age of the person and how kind of involved in civic engagement they are. That's a couple examples. Thank you. And as I said, it's ever evolving in a most wonderful way. As more people with disabilities are in these discussions, they're letting us know how they want to be identified or referred as. So I think it's cool. And I always ask, how do you describe your disability? How do you want me to refer to it? I don't make those assumptions. It's a great question. Now, since we're here to talk about voting, let's talk about some of the barriers to voting specific to people with disabilities. A big one, and Marilyn has touched on this, is, is transportation. How do you get to the polling place to vote? Um, waiting in lines can be difficult with people with disabilities. Printing the accessible vote by mail ballots out, and we're going to talk about accessible vote by mail later, so we can come back to that. Uh, signature mismatch or signatures changing over time as a disability progresses. Polling sites are not fully accessible a lot of times, and really important is the training that poll workers get on how to interact with people with disabilities and how to use the accessible voting machines that are required at each of the polls. Marilyn, you wanna add in to this? Yes, keeping these things in mind, people with disabilities will have to make a very specific plan for voting, uh, transportation. How will I get to the polls? Who can assist me? Uh, and this is an area where volunteers can help those individuals that are um, ambulatory. In other words, individuals who can walk. And um, so that is that would remove, we and maybe contact 
your local transit system and ask them what are their plans for helping folks with disabilities to get to the polls. And if you are an individual that has a chronic health problem or mobility issues, standing in line can really be difficult. Um, I don't do well standing in one place. And um, we'll skip the third one because she's right. We're going to talk about that one. Um, not all polling sites are accessible. And that is a, a, big, a ramp can be a barrier just to getting into the building. And um, if your aisles that people have to walk through are cluttered, that is going to present a barrier for persons with disabilities. And then we believe strongly that every poll worker should have some experience on using the accessible voting machines. It would be horrible for a person with a disability to go to a vote polling location and no one there knows how to use the machine. And this is the voters first time using it. And I believe that legally each polling location must have at least one accessible voting machine that is in operation. Yeah, and you'd think it, common sense, right? Um, of course the polls are accessible because it's done by the government, but one in nine people with disabilities report having trouble wow. voting and two thirds of polling places are not fully compliant yet. So it's a huge barrier to voting. Yes. One of the things we have in Palm Beach County that I'm not sure everybody is aware of during early voting, they can sign up for an appointment to go in. So you can have a limited wait time and you just go in and, do, and vote. So it's something we need to make sure people know about and are able to access. Do they have to go to the supervisor of elections office? No, they go to any the early voting sites. And Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. I think Kate has her hand up. Yes, thank you. I was surprised when you said that most polling places are not accessible. Um, we run a nonpartisan election protection poll monitor program here, and that's one of many things that we watch for. We watch for accessible parking, accessible polls, and availability of accessible machines. So where do you see the problems? How are some polls not accessible? We may need to add it to our list. Well, because usually they're places local in the community. So sometimes they're an Elks Club or they're these other kind of facilities that aren't might not have fully complied or or been involved in that. Do you know what I mean? They're not always schools or libraries or places that are really on top of that. And a lot of times it could be there's no accessible parking spots. There's no way to get from the street as Marilyn was saying, into the building or inside the building, the path of travel. So because depending on where you are in the state, where the SOE decides is gonna be a polling site, that's where it kind of gets a little more complicated sometimes. I suppose it's much harder on election day than during early voting. I think most of the early voting sites are pretty good, but thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I wanted to say about transportation as Marilyn was talking about that we have the special transportation it's done by county and so a lot of people that want to use that you have to register in advance you have to stay a certain amount of time so it's not like they can request this transportation have go to the poll they wait there while you vote come back so you have this this extended amount of time and do they show up on time so I know like Uber and Lyft offer rides to the polls. However, there's not usually accessible vehicles. So it's, it doesn't work as equally or as seamlessly for people with disabilities. So, so one of the things that we looked at from the disability perspective is how can we educate the local county transportation part that does this special transportation and make some kind of accommodation for the day of whether 
they can drop them, wait 10 minutes, they get the person with the disability can get to the front of the line, vote, and then wait so that they're not stuck in this transportation complication loop, which makes that a barrier to voting. Marilyn, you want to add anything else before we move on? No, I think you did good. <laughs> Okay, so accessible vote by mail. It's um, a big deal. It's something that Marilyn and I have been involved with before it became an option. Um, my organization actually was involved in the litigation that allowed this to be an option. We know about vote by mail that has been around and anyone can request a ballot that they get in the mail. The problem is those um, ballots aren't accessible for all people with disabilities. So what the state did is make accessible vote by mail, which means that the person would request the absentee ballot to vote by mail. However, instead of using the paper ballot, they would log into a computer system, vote online through an accessible system, and then print the ballot out put it in the same sleeve, and then mail it back the way that you would mail the paper ballot. Now, there's some problems with that process for people with disabilities. So when the litigation happened, it was like, do we want it every way or do we wanna get step one done and then keep fighting for the other to increase the accessibility? And that was what was settled on. So people, with print disabilities, they call it, which is beyond just a vision disability, it's called print disability, have the ability to request to vote through a computer and then print that ballot out and return it in the sleeve that everyone else uses for voting by mail. All 67 counties have it. Each county does it their own unique way. <laughs> so you have to talk to your supervisor of elections to figure out there's three different systems that they use, depending on which one they negotiated a contract with. And there's different ways to request it. So every county is a little bit different, but every county has to, by law, offer it and make it available to people with disabilities. Marilyn, you want to add sure. to that? Some of the barriers for those of us who are blind, even with this accessible voting machine, the technology, is that the ballot will need to be printed out to mail. Well, if I'm totally blind, I probably don't have a printer at home. And then there's the challenge of the signature on the envelope. Um, if you're totally or partially blind, uh, your signature uh, may not may vary from time to time, and you don't necessarily know where to sign. Some SOEs have provided stickers on these um, accessible vote by mail ballots that will guide the person to signing. So, in essence, until we get to the next two or three steps. Even though we have the vote by mail system, those of us who are blind or print impaired still need the assistance of someone else. It would be my dream one day that voting by mail for persons with disabilities would be very much like they do it in the service where you can vote safely and securely online. Yeah, and so that that's the, the debate, the problem comes in that there's this argument of security, mm -hmm. of returning the ballots digitally or electronically. Um, it's very complicated from my, from my perspective, it's not an issue, but the other side thinks it is an issue. So um, it is not resolved yet on that answer and right now the answer is no you cannot electronically return them so yes you can vote privately and independently but you might need help printing and mailing back that vote that you did so complicated but that's what it is 
anybody with a print disability qualifies. What that means is um, if you have a reading disability, if um, you have an intellectual developmental disability, if you had a stroke or a neurological disability, if you have trouble with your fine motor skills, all anybody with those types of disabilities will qualify to vote through the computer system. And the SOE just asks if you need it, if you have a disability, they're not supposed to ask you any kind of questions. You don't need proof to show it in order to get this option. We made um, two videos, our statewide voting coalition that, that are available online that I gave you links to at the end. So you, we actually made videos on how this works and how a person with a disability could use it. And we'll share the links with you at the end. Marilyn, I switched the screen to list the resources that everyone will have available. What I put, the first one is this great study by Rutgers University that gives all these statistics that we were telling you. And each election cycle, they are studying the disability vote and really trying to quantify that. The second is the Legal Women Voters from Orange County's Volunteer Guide with all the details on the disability sensitivity that we were discussing. And then we made a digital brochure on accessible vote by mail. It's in English, Spanish, Creole, and you can download it or print it if you guys want. And then we have videos that are how to use the in-person accessible voting machines and how to use the accessible vote by mail. They're all fully accessible with sign language, um, audio descriptions, captioning, and they're available for you guys to watch, use, share, and be a resource for you. And then I just, Marilyn, I just switched the screen that has both of our names and our email addresses if anybody wants to follow up with us.